to Genovo Farmstead, Poland, 1887. A misfortune came to the Polish Dzienowo farmstead that day. Helena Dzienska was cooking dinner for her children. Her sons were playing in the yard, and all the daughters, except for the 15-year-old Wanda, were helping their mother. Wanda was in her room. Suddenly, a shot rang out outside. Felix Dzienski was standing there with a gun in his hands. He didn't know that it was loaded. Carried away by the game, he aimed at the window and pulled the trigger. A sudden shot deafened him. Then came the heart-rending scream. His elder sister, Vanda, stained with blood, was lying on the floor. What happened in a matter of seconds would haunt him for the rest of his life. He had killed his older sister. The feeling of guilt turned the Polish nobleman, Felix Dzienski, into an iron-hard Soviet Czechist. In a bid to improve the world by creating an ideal society, he tortured millions of people to death. Later, he tried to correct what he'd done, but it was too late. On the 21st of June, 1926, the Soviet newspapers published some stunning news. Suddenly, Felix Dzinski, the all-powerful chairman of the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution Joint State Political Directorate, died. Officially, he had died of a heart attack due to overwork, but not many people believed it. Far from being classified, Dzinski's autopsy protocol had been published in the newspapers along with the funeral telegrams, giving rise to the rumors. The content of this protocol shocked the modern pathologists. I became acquainted with the protocol and have some serious doubts about it. A corpse of an aged male of regular build and average weight the height is slightly increased in size. The breathing passages are unchanged. The lungs are both soft and pneumatic, slightly swollen. His ribs remain unchanged. Dzinski had once suffered from severe tuberculosis, but no intrinsic traces of tuberculosis are described. Pathologists report his death was caused by heart failure, as a consequence of blocked arteries. It was reported that all the organs except for his heart were unharmed, but this could not have been true. The autopsy had been carried out in a hurry and at night. There were so many mistakes in the protocol as though it had been written by a student in reality, it was made up by Professor Abrikosov, whose textbooks and manuals are still used in medical institutes today. What was the honored professor trying to hide? Why did he perform the autopsy in such a hurry? These are unique shots of Ian Felix's funeral. Among those following the coffin is a man dressed in bright white, Joseph Stalin. At the time, he was virtually the sole ruler of the Soviet Union. Even in this worn-out film, you can see that he is obviously satisfied and even smiles. Why was Stalin so happy at the funeral of the main counter-revolutionary fighter? Soon after the funeral, there were rumors in Moscow that Dzerzhinsky had been poisoned under Stalin's order. But why? 
Dzerzhinsky's people worked in different organizations. Some were assistants to the high officials of the Soviet Communist Party. As the head of the secret political police, Dzerzhinsky gathered information from all of them. That was the reason why people feared and hated Iron Felix. They could have murdered him just to silence him. Each member of the ruling elite had something to hide or be ashamed of. This version of events would seem the most probable, but for one document, which was found at the table of Felix Dzerzhinsky. It was a warning letter to an unknown recipient, which began with the words, I am tired of living and working. What is the true meaning of these words? Joseph Stalin answered this question in his farewell funeral speech. Comrade Dzerzhinsky, a devoted Bolshevik and defender of the revolution, had burnt himself out at work. The members of the Politburo, who were present at the funeral, knew that it was not the work that burnt him out, but Stalin himself. A phoenix of the family. That's how relatives referred to little Felix. The boy knew since childhood that he was an extraordinary child with a great future. He also knew well the story of his birth. During the last month of her pregnancy, Helena Dzerzhinska suddenly fell down the stairs into her cellar. The fall caused bleeding and premature birth. The newborn child was traumatized and weak. Nobody, except for the zealous Catholic Helena, believed that he would survive. She promised that if her boy survived, she would do everything in her power to make him a committed Catholic who would spread happiness and justice to the people. If only Helena knew that by adhering to this noble cause, her son would drown the country in blood that he would turn his comrades, officials of Cheka, into torturers, and that he would break God's laws without the slightest hesitation. If Helena had been told about how her son would end up, she would never have believed it. She named her son Felix, which means happy. He was the cleverest and the kindest of her children, a devoted and loving son. Helena always told her children that people are kind and the world is ruled by a benign God. She believed this even after her husband died from tuberculosis and she was left alone and penniless with eight small children. The Zhinskys family lived in poverty. They ate only potatoes but prayed zealously and believed that this ordeal would end one day. Even when he became one of the most powerful people of the state, Felix took care of the family's financial arrangements, as he always had. He kept records of every single expenditure. To make ends meet, Helena leased her estate to well-to-do peasants. She taught her children that there was no stigma in being poor and that the most important things in life were mutual consent in the family and humanism. Give and you will receive. Felix believed his mother until an unpleasant incident that made him doubt people's kindness. He would never forget the day he met two youngsters near his farmstead. They were the children of the rich Russian from the village who had leased their estate. Felix was in a hurry, but the older boys blocked his way and mocked him. They called him the poor Pole and his mother the dirty Polish beggar. He attacked them to protect the name of the woman he worshipped. 
he was severely beaten for the first time in his life. Felix would receive many more beatings throughout his life from fellow workmen, crime investigators, and prison officers during 11 years imprisonment. But that first humiliating experience would stay with him for the rest of his life. He returned home beaten and bruised. His mother caressed and consoled him. Before going to bed, he asked her why the boys had insulted them. Helena told her children that good does not always triumph, and sometimes life is cruel. She explained that the country was divided by two powerful empires that consider Polish people to be less than human, but that the omnipresent God would protect them. Felix whispered, when I grow up, I will hang all the Russians. At that moment, something terrible was triggered in his soul. He believed that he could only create the ideal world through violent action. His search for equality was actually the search for a hypothetic father. His father had died too young, so he couldn't understand the concept of justice. He understood good by his mother's example. She taught him about kindness and justice, but at a psychological level, justice is instilled by the father. He took every violent incident personally and swore to avenge and ultimately destroy evil. Felix was determined to avenge for his childhood trauma. He learned to stand up for himself. Felix enjoyed fighting and would settle every dispute with his fists. His mother began to realize that her vulnerable and sensitive son was becoming bad-tempered and reckless. The seemingly trivial incident with the teenagers had in fact transformed him into a revolutionary fanatic. A 14-year-old Felix was playing in the yard while his mother cooked the holiday dinner in the kitchen. His elder sister, Vanda, was reading. He took his brother's gun to play with and set some targets. He didn't realize the gun was loaded or that Vanda was standing by the window. He aimed at his imaginary enemies, pulled the trigger and fired a shot. How could it be? He was sure that the gun was not loaded. He heard a terrible scream saw blood and the terrified expression in his mother's eyes as she looked at his dead sister. This image would haunt him for the rest of his life. It had been a terrible mistake. To save her son from punishment, Helena concealed the truth. She forbade the children to talk about the incident and settled the issue with the police. She only had one problem, Felix. He felt like an evil sinner. He saw his sister everywhere and constantly apologized to her, but there was no relief. He dreamt of protecting the whole world, but became a killer instead. What was God punishing him for? After that tragic incident, his life changed. He attempted to be more patient and humble and fasted. He decided to devote his life to God to gain forgiveness. 
Felix spent all his time preparing for theological college. When the time came for Felix to go, his mother failed to give him her blessing, but instead sent him to the priest to make his confession. After a long confessional, the Polish priest told Felix, you are not fit to become a priest. You are guided only by your pride and pain. You're not able to give light and hope to people. A stunned Felix remained silent as his sacrifice had been denied. In the mind of a faithful Christian, God is seen as a father figure. Felix was disappointed by God's envoys and so decided to follow Lenin's example. We will take a different way. Felix would gain God's approval by other means. Twenty years later, under Lenin's orders, Felix Dzerzhinsky started a bloody struggle against religion. He ordered the destruction of temples, the removal of church valuables, the burning of icons, and the torturing of priests. Lenin encouraged him, saying, the more priests you kill, the better. He was killing thousands of people, and on one night, he dreamt of Vanda, who only wanted to know one thing. Felix, what for? During his childhood, the only thing that kept him sane was the conviction that he had to atone for his sin. But how? The answer lay in a book at that time, Friedrich Nietzsche's forbidden work, Antichrist, fell into his hands. Felix shuddered when he read it. What is good? Power. What is wrong? Weakness. Christian compassion is more harmful than any vice. This would be his epiphany. He had to rid himself of weakness and eradicate the memory of his childhood mistake. He would gain redemption by dedicating himself to one noble cause. Nietzsche had convinced the impressionable boy that the modern world had been built by priests who lied about the importance of humility. He believed that it was possible to create a better society run by strong and noble people. Felix realized it was time to act. He was a combination of a religious fanatic and a fiery revolutionary. In fact, such a combination is not rare. An ardent revolutionary and a religious fanatic are twin brothers. Each believes that they can change the world. Felix wanted to open his mother's eyes about faith and religion. But she had become bedridden. She died in Felix's arms without warning him that his fiery, fanatical nature could cause great harm to himself and others. After his mother's death, Felix left school. He had no money, no connections or education. There was no future in a society where, in his opinion, all were built on lies. Besides that, he truly believed that the world could be changed. Soon, he would learn how. Coming up next, the birth of a monster, the first love of Iron Felix, the verdict of doctors. Why did Dzerzhinsky have to die? How did he create the Cheka? Saving priests was the terrible mistake of the head of the OGPU.
In a noisy basement room in Vilnius, heated debates about the republic and democracy, the eight-hour working day, authorities of the proletariat, and the oppression of the bourgeoisie took place every night. This was an illegal Marxist circle. With the help of this fanatically devoted crowd, Felix found a new faith and a clear vision of the future, building a new world at any price, even if that meant destroying all dissent. Felix was only 20 years old, but was already known as a gifted revolutionary. Tirelessly and recklessly, he would print leaflets and paste them around the city streets. He fired up workers in the night cabarets and organized rallies and strikes. One day, it all came to an end. He had been betrayed. As in childhood, he felt that people disliked him and the world was cruel. While in prison, Felix stopped being compassionate because he was suffering constant beatings. The police interrogated him about his accomplices' names and the addresses of the secret printing houses. He refused to answer, even if it meant dying. He was in exile, escaped and exiled again. He spent 11 long years behind bars where he lost all his humanity and lived with hate and faith. Eleven years of torment, torture and restrictions confirmed all his beliefs about human nature. Many times he felt suicidal as his life seemed pointless. But every time he came back from the brink of despair as he was sure there was still a way to find his spiritual father. He still believed in God. Every day in prison, he took his paralyzed comrade out for a walk so that he could look at the sky. He quarreled with the guards, demanding humane treatment of prisoners and observance of human rights. Because of this, he spent months in the cooler, but the prisoners were praying for his release. And then he had a wild idea that the revolution could start right there in prison. In May 1902, he raised a revolt in one of the prisons. During the daily walk, he signaled to his comrades by spitting in the face of the most brutal warden. Within seconds, 44 political prisoners had disarmed the guards. At his call, the prisoners removed all the guards and declared themselves an independent republic. They then hung out a red flag with the Liberty inscription. Dzerzhinsky was unanimously declared to be the president. The triumph was short-lived, the rebellion was defeated, but Dzerzhinsky would always remember the empowering feeling of leading a crowd. He was then exiled to Siberia, where the thoughts about the struggle and escape gave way to a new feeling. Felix saw an incredibly beautiful woman. For the first time, he fell in love. Her name was Margarita. She was a beauty, an aristocrat, and a revolutionary just like him. All the repressed love, tenderness, and sensuality suddenly broke forth. Margarita agreed to become his wife. Together, they planned his escape. They came to an agreement to wait two years and then get married. 
Margarita had no idea that this would be their last encounter. He arrived in Poland, exhausted and sick. Then the bleeding started. Felix was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Doctors gave him three years to live. And what about his beloved Margarita? What about his cause? Was this the end? Felix decided that Margarita must not know about his disease and should not sacrifice herself. He wrote, telling her to forget about him. For three years, he lived as if in a dream. There were lots of fiery speeches, meetings and acquaintances with members of the underground organizations from other countries. At that time, Sofia Mushkat, or Zosia, another ardent revolutionary, helped him with his work. She looked up to Felix with enthusiasm and passion. Among the revolutionaries, he was already considered a living legend, a jailbreaker, and a fanatical fighter for justice. Felix didn't allow himself to fall in love with her. He lived for the cause. And then a miracle happened. The surprised doctors stated that the tuberculosis was in remission. He considered this a sign that God believed in his mission and had forgiven him. His dead sister would no longer haunt him. He could at last live again. So Felix proposed to Zosia. Their family happiness lasted only three months. The revolution was a curse that stood between them. The already pregnant Zosia agreed to implement the next assignment of the party, not knowing that it would be eight years until she would see Felix again. She was trapped before she had time to carry out her task. They were both arrested and separated. In prison, Zosia gave birth prematurely to a son, Yasika. Soon, she would be transported under guard to Siberia. Her family took care of the baby. Nobody knows what would have happened to them if it had not been for Felix. He knew that somewhere far away, his wife and child were waiting, and so he escaped from prison for the third time and freed Zosia. Dzerzhinsky never forgot about his wife, he sent her money and organized her escape from exile. She ended up in Switzerland, where she was found a job. She was amazed when after eight years, Dzerzhinsky finally returned to her. Felix had been an exile, an underground revolutionary, but now he was a well-known and respected figure. But how did a jailbreaker and a revolutionary become one of the most popular politicians in Russia? It was the long-awaited revolution which helped him. In February 1917, the door to the ward of Felix Dzerzhinsky was unexpectedly opened. All of a sudden, he heard the magic word, freedom. The Tsar abdicated, and the provisional government announced an amnesty for political prisoners. What should he do? Should he go immediately to Switzerland to embrace his wife and son? Or should he stay here? Felix was true to himself. He chose the revolution. During the October Revolution in Petrograd, Dzerzhinsky led the militants and the Red Sailors and occupied the Central Bank, the Central Telegraph and the Post Office. He provided information about the Council of People's Commissars, headed by Lenin. When Cheka was formed on the 7th or the 20th in the new calendar, he went to Lenin and said, I want to be the leader. Lenin knew that Dzerzhinsky had spent 11 years in Tsarist prisons. Nobody could organize reprisals better than Iron Felix.
Dzerzhinsky maniacally and devotedly assembled a team of fighters and rushed to defend his country, overrun with enemies. Revolutions are always accompanied by death. We will apply all necessary means. I only demand the organization of a revolutionary reprisal. They use the most brutal methods, blackmail, bribery, shooting. Everyone was aware of what was going on. It was the basis of their power, and they used their punitive authority against the whole society. During the first year, he lived in his office at Lubyanka, where he trained inexperienced Czechists. From here, he carried out raids and searches. He personally provided Lenin with a list of people to be shot and always conducted interrogations at night when the prisoners were at their most vulnerable. People were also shot at night under cover of the noise produced by the trucks at Lubyanka. I'm sure that his destructive behavior was subconsciously a grudge against humanity. He'd been an unpopular child. Only his mother loved him. Resentment was building up. He continued to take revenge on the world under the disguise of a great idea. His subconscious desire had terrible consequences. For two years, the new punitive agency, headed by Dzerzhinsky, destroyed more than a million enemies of the revolution. Hundreds of people per night, without trial, and often for no real reason, just because of a suspicion. Through the Cheka, Dzerzhinsky opened the gates of hell. All the dregs of society joined in to secure some of their own needs with the help of this government body acting on behalf of the country. There's no doubt that numerous undesirables were among the Czechists. Soon, the Czechists became overwhelmed by bloodlust and turned into maniacs and psychopaths. Only Dzerzhinsky remained sane throughout the ensuing madness. In that terrible time, he wrote in a letter to one of his sisters. I am the same as I was, although for many people there is no more terrible name than mine. Today, I'm still driven by desire for justice. He was not a maniac ready to destroy the world. He conducted purges in the hope that they would end someday. When he realized the effect these actions were having on his troops, he was horrified. The realization of what was happening came to him when his wife and son returned from Switzerland. They had not seen each other for eight long years. Prison life was in the past. The revolution had triumphed, but there was no happiness. The bright idea was blackened by all the bloodshed. Zosia noticed what was happening immediately. Every night, when Felix came home, he saw his wife's terrified expression. She didn't understand why people were being forcibly removed from the streets or why innocent people were being taken hostage. Czechists were even shooting children. That same day, she saw a child being taken away. Zosia needed answers, but Felix was keeping quiet. Every morning, he went to Lubyanka. While everything remained the same, the cabinet, the interrogations, 
the signatures and the shootings, something in him had changed. He realized that their blacklists contained not a single white officer or counter-revolutionary, only ordinary workers and peasants whose happiness he had devoted his life to. He realized something had gone wrong, but still struggled with himself. He still obeyed the orders of Lenin and the party, but had lost sight of the ultimate goal. He could not create an equal society where everyone could be happy. Dzerzhinsky had been drained by his work. I believe that he was a broken man who didn't care about his own health. In the end, tension and tuberculosis overwhelmed him. With a habitual motion, he signed the current shooting list. The document was taken away. Felix anxiously tried to figure out what was wrong with that document. The surnames in the list had been Polish. Felix tried to remember the exact names and suddenly grew cold. He had just ordered the execution of several Catholic priests. Felix remembered his mother, a bright, kind person and a committed Christian. And Wanda, the wise old priest, who had warned him, you are driven by your pride and pain. You are not capable of giving hope to people. Dzerzhinsky realized he had just signed the death warrant to his faith, which he'd been trying to deny for so many years. Iron Felix ran through the corridors of Lubyanka, his heart racing. He intended to stop the reprisal. That day, he achieved the impossible by saving the priests. It was only the beginning. Several weeks later, he issued the following order. All members of the White Guard organizations who surrender within a week will be guaranteed impunity from Dzerzhinsky. A year later, he saved Wrangel, General Shlashov, and lots of other White Guard officers, writers and artists. In 1920, Dzerzhinsky banned the death penalty for political prisoners. In 1921, during a party meeting, he suddenly announced his resignation. I do not want, and more importantly, I cannot work here anymore. My hand never trembled when I had to destroy our class enemies. I was willing to die for the revolutionary struggle. I fought for the rights of workers and peasants. And now you ask me to repress them. Please understand, I cannot do it. He handed in his resignation twice, but was refused both times. Dzerzhinsky was assigned numerous missions so that he had no time to think. In addition to leading the Cheka, now he also had to lead numerous committees for street children's support and for global communications issues. He grew more and more depressed. After Lenin's death, finally everything changed. Stalin surrounded himself with submissive and unprincipled bureaucratic colleagues. He began to create a new totalitarian state. He forced Dzerzhinsky to remove bread from the peasants under the supervision of the GPU. Now Zosia and Yasika rarely saw him. When he returned home, he locked himself away and studied textbooks on sociology and economics. He submitted proposals concerning the liberalization of the market economy and the ending of peasant exploitation. 
But nobody listened to Dzerzhinsky. His behavior was put down to exhaustion and an unstable mind. Stalin did not need a heaven on earth. He needed a strong, controlled state based on tyranny. I relieve myself of responsibility for the state of our industry and economy and herewith ask you to start an issue on my resignation. Dzerzhinsky addressed these letters to Stalin and the Politburo members. Nobody reacted to them. It seemed as though they were trying to cause a reaction from him. Sure enough, he lost his temper. Dzerzhinsky was warning everyone that he was tired of working and living. On that fateful day, on the 20th of July 1926, Dzerzhinsky appeared on the plenum of Central Committee. He appeared to be sick, but spoke forcibly, accusing the party of bureaucracy and betrayal of the revolutionary ideal. He threw accusations at his former ideological allies. Felix's fanatical belief in an equal society had become irritating. What right does he have to preach? Who needs his sermons? Thought the members of the Politburo. After all, he himself was not without sin. His hands were stained with blood. Felix spoke for two hours. When he'd finished, he suddenly heard the executioner. After that, Dzerzhinsky staggered down from the platform and went to the door. All the way home, a single word throbbed in his head. The executioner. They were right. It had started with wonder and ended with thousands upon thousands of strangers, all tortured at his command. When Felix came to the apartment, Zosia did not recognize him. He was like a living corpse. He silently walked into his office, turned to his wife and said, everything is lost. The revolution is over. We are finished. Then he closed the door behind him. Zosia Dzerzhinska never saw him alive again. At the funeral, Comrade Stalin was smiling. The era of fanaticism had ended with Dzerzhinsky's death. But a new malevolent dictatorship had begun. During Stalin's reign, more than 20 million people were murdered in prison camps. Iron Felix had created a terrible repressive machine that his disciples were now using to cause mayhem and destruction. <laughs>